Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Blood on the Razor Wire TV. I have a special guest here today that went to federal prison. He was accused of some terrorist type of things. His name is Yusuf. He's from Morocco. He's been through some stuff in the prison system where he was beefing with the Muslims, and he's a Muslim himself. But I want to let Yusuf tell you about himself and where he's from and what happened with him when he went to prison, some of the things that he's seen. So, Yusuf, tell the people who you are. Tell them where you're from and tell the people to hit that subscribe button. Subscribe and give us a thumbs up if you like the video. Okay, no problem. Well, thanks for having me on, Chad. My name is Yusuf. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm from the United States. Uh, we, our family's in Morocco as well. I was born in Atlantic City, uh, New Jersey. And, uh, you know, we only have like a half hour here, I think, so I, I can't go into great detail. But uh, what happened was, a certain group of people were cheering at the uh, Israelis to drop the Israeli military. But, uh, they dropped the phosphorus bomb on Gaza, which is a civilian population. That's a war crime. That's supposed to use phosphorus bombs on civilian populations. Some people were dancing and singing about it. And I, you know, I said something that could, could be interpreted as a threat. Uh, in, you know, looking... In, in hindsight, it was it, it was a better, it was not a smart thing that I did, and I was very political and I was very outspoken at the time. So the government used this case. Uh, my co-defendant, he pled guilty to something because when he was in charge, I used to run an organization. My co-defendant took over the organization. Somebody from his organization really made a, a real threat, and uh, since he was the head of it, he fought a case. He pled guilty, and then they went after me because I used to head that organization, and he pleaded guilty under the crimes under uh, under me when it was under my wing. So I ended up, uh, I've never had a felony or a misdemeanor in my life. I grew up, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a street kid, but I never was involved in crime. I, I, so I never really was with criminals. And, um, you know, when I came to the prison system, it was a, I was green. I'm not used to this at all. And I really don't deal with criminals. So it was some adventure. And uh, so I went in in 2013. I, they put 45 years of charges on me. And they told me I could plead. That was four counts. They told me just plead to one of them. And uh, the, the, the one I pleaded to had a five-year maximum. The other ones had like 20-something years. So I took the plea. And I said I was guilty of this. And uh, I ended up getting two years and six months of which I did two years of three months, 85% of the time and three years on paper, three years supervised release. So let me ask you this, Yusuf, you go to prison. What was your first prison as far as the Bureau of Prisons? Was it Raybrook? Raybrook, Raybrook was my first prison. Yeah. And um, so it was, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It was Raybrook. Yes. All right. So you're in Raybrook. You're part of the Muslim community. You've been a Muslim since birth, correct? Well, well, I, I wasn't, wasn't religious as a kid, but, I, but I, I've been most the majority, the majority of my most of my, of my adult, adult life. life. Okay, so how did the Muslim dudes accept you when you got the Raybrook? I mean, was did they embrace you? I mean, tell the people about that. Okay, uh, well, what happened was when I got there. First of all, I, I know nothing about cars or any of these things. And a car is a group of Muslim, uh, a group of people that you join together with in a federal prison. Uh, I assume from a medium and up. I don't know what it's like in a low. Uh, so the first thing that happens, you walk in there and somebody walks over to you and they say, uh, hey, how you doing? Where are you from? So uh, you tell them where you're from and how'd you get here and, and who do you run with? <laughs> who do I run with? I don't even know what you're talking about. Bro. So uh, I told them, you know, I'm, I'm Muslim. I, oh, you're Muslim? So they, if you're Muslim, they just throw you to the Muslim, right? So then the Muslims come in, a Muslim representative, and he says, here's soap, here's your shower shoes, and this and that, blah, blah, blah. And uh, they assume that I'm with the Muslims. So I sat with them. I didn't know that's not a good thing. I mean, Muslims really aren't looked up as, I mean, and I'm saying this is, is, is Prislam, not, not Islam. Muslims in prison are not really looked up to, and they're really not a great example in general. There are some good ones. And... Uh, I'll go into that a little bit later. So the Muslims came to me and uh, I ended up with them. Uh, somebody we both know, Kanye. He, you know, he was my celly at first. They put you in a six man before you get your own cell. 
And uh, I was I was living in there, and then I they put me in my own cell, you know, with a paisa, and he was the unit rep from the paisas. So I didn't really want to have anything to do with the Muslims there because they were disgusting, and they're not really. You see, it in in a, in a federal prison, they check paperwork. That means they want to see your sentencing minutes. They want to see your uh, your docket your docket sheet, and uh, the Muslims don't do that. Because they believe that if you're a Muslim, all your past sins don't matter. And that's true in Islam. But in prison, it's a whole different story. It doesn't work like that. So they're very not respected and they're not trusted amongst them. And remember, these are the same people as everybody else. They're in prison. So I went in there. I was disgusted with what I saw. And I wanted to have nothing to do with them. So I started to sit with our friend Cedric. I asked him if I could sit with him at the Christian table. Because I'm just here to do my time. I'm not here... I didn't join a, a Muslim community. You know, and I'm just doing my time that they sentenced me to. It happens to me that they're telling me to sit here. I made some bad moves in Raybrook, meaning I challenged the Muslims. And you never do that in prison. That was a very stupid move. So things got heated, and I'm a Sunni Muslim, which means I follow, I'm Ashari in, in Creed, uh, I'm Maliki, I follow a, a school of thought, and we believe in Tasawwuf, which is super. They don't, these are Wahhabis, most of them. They're from like Saudi Arabian doctrine. So they don't like me and they don't like what I'm about. And I challenged them. I could have just shut my mouth, which I should have done. And I didn't. And I took them on and I got run off the compound. Spent six months in solitary confinement. And uh, after that, they shipped me off to USB Canaan and on the, you know, just on the way transfer and then to Schuylkill. I want to talk about. You said they ran you off. The Muslims ran you off. I mean, was there violence? Was there threatened violence? Well, first of all, they, there was a certain amount of respect because they knew that they knew I just had to go. You understand? But they know that I'm a Muslim, so they don't really want to get blood on them. You, know, you understand? They don't want to make it ugly. So what they did was they came out and they said, hey, man, you got to go now. And they, they got the, the, the imam. And his security, which would be the shot caller and his, you know, his right hand man. I don't know how to explain it, but that's how it runs by the Muslims. So they sent me up. They sent me up there. So they sent you. There's a lot. Hold on, hold on. We got to tell the people what that is. They sent you up. Okay, sending you up means that they send you in. They send you off the compound. You got to get off the compound, or you're going to get killed or stabbed. So they they send me up into uh, what do you call it? Into the shoe special housing unit. And then you have to wait there at least. If you go to the shoe, you got to stay for one month until you see SIS, which is like the FBI of the of the prison, Federal Bureau of Prison. And uh, so I went up there, and you know I have to wait thirty days. And they asked me, uh, "Did anybody hurt you?" I said, "No." What's the story? And I said, "No comment." And so that being the case, the imam and his 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 other little thug there, they went back onto the compound, and I had to wait be shipped. You understand how that works? 100%. Let me ask you this, though. While you were at Raybrook, did you see any violence in there? Any knives? Any trouble? What did you see while you were yeah, there? Raybrook, yeah, I, I've seen people get stabbed, and I've, I've, I've seen, and I'm assuming that the guy, they, they had like an AB guy. I don't know if he's really AB. I'm just, that's what he says he is. The guy was like six foot five. He was huge. He was from Pittsburgh, and he never saw the compound. They didn't let him walk. They, they didn't want, this is what I heard. Because you don't know really what's the truth when you're up there. So they said he was AB, and the guys, the white guys in Raybrook don't want AB on the compound. You know, guys that are active members. So he had to go. They kept him, and he told the warden to, I don't know, to go perform a biological impossibility on himself or something. So they made him stay a year in the shoe. So he's in there, and this, this little Mexican guy comes in. And they put him in a cell with this guy. This guy's vicious and he's big. He's like six five, if not bigger. Next thing you know, they, there's guys banging on the door, banging on the door. The, the COs didn't even, the correction officers didn't even come to help him. He broke the he broke the glass on the thing. They come in there and he, they, they say that this, this cell smells like feces. And uh, they, that guy, when he gets out on the compound, he gets out not the compound. The uh, when he gets in the yard, he got one hour a day in the yard. He says, yeah, he doesn't know what happened to that guy. You know, he just he told me he asked him where his, his stamps are. And he said he just 
He didn't want to give it to him, so he hit him. And I think he crapped himself because it smells like, but they went in there with this, you know, that they have a kit where they check for DNA. So I'm pretty sure that he raped the, I mean, he was a little dude too. It doesn't make sense that he crapped himself like that. So, um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty vicious. And it didn't have to happen. And there's no panic buttons there in Raybrook. Okay, so a panic button's a button in the cell that, you know, someone can press and the cops will come. But in Raybrook, they don't have those. So this guy was able to rape this guy freely without anybody coming in there and helping him. And he was banging on the windows. He broke the glass. You know, they have that wire glass, that little piece that's like this, this wide. Uh, so I saw that happen there. And I've seen in, in Schuylkill, I've seen many times. But remember, I was in a medium compound. I wasn't, I wasn't in, a, in a pen. But there's violence, and violence can happen. You, you, you will fall in line. You understand? Don't fool yourself. And what happens in a pen can happen in a medium. But most of the people in school kill where I was at, they work their way down from a pen, and they really don't want to go back unless they're gang members or something like that. So this guy that rapes this guy, are you familiar with the term that they use in prison, booty bandits? Yeah, I've heard that. But like, I've, I've, you saw, you know, I never really hung out with those kind of people. And I really didn't know too much. What I knew in prison was if, if you were a queer, I mean, you're gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna have a good outcome. But I don't know any straight guys that ended up getting, you know, getting raped because it's just a violation. If you belong to a car, the cars, that, the whole idea of a car is you're not gonna get extorted and you're not gonna get raped in general. That's, that's how I understand it. But the guy in the hole ended up raping that guy. So he was a booty bandit. Yeah, I guess I guess that's what it was. But you know, I can't confirm it, nor can I confirm if this guy was actually an AB guy. But that's that's what they told me. I would say probably I would say probably not if he's raping people. But you know, things happen in prison, like we both know. So now you had spoke about the Muslims, and you were mu you're Muslim, and did you ever feel at any point like you thought these dudes were going to try to kill you if you didn't go? Do you think they would have stabbed you, or were they bluffing? Yeah, no, no, it's, they were going to, they're not bluffing. I mean, they're going to hurt you. They're going to, this is prison. But the thing is in prison, you can't make waves. You stay off the radar from the prisoners and from the administration. And this is an important point, even more so than the rape. You know, like when I did this interview, there's people like me that are green that are going go to go to prison and they don't know what it's like. And it's something I want to drive home. Just stay in your lane, mind your business and you don't have to tell anybody anything. I, I made the mistake of not doing it. And I opened my mouth too much. So the shot caller there, the Muslim shot caller, did you feel like he wanted to get you? Like he Because I remember the incident. I remember what was going on. But did you feel like in his heart that he was giving you a way out, but really he didn't want to, that he wanted to hurt you? I'll be honest with you. I don't think, I don't think, as much as I dislike him, even, even though I think they're a deviant sect and this and that, I think, you know, he I, he put up with a lot of my crap. You understand? I was out of pocket. I really was. As much as I hate him and I think I stick to my principles, I was wrong. I didn't know how to do my time. I didn't know how to bid. When I got to school kill, things changed. I got to school kill. And uh, this guy comes over to me and he's he's got that uh, white, white power, not white pride. Right? So he was, I don't know what he was with. His name was Mud. And he was a very nice guy. He's a big, big dude. He's like another guy about six foot three, bold SS things on him. So he said, you know, he tells me, you know, Yusuf, we consider you white here. And uh, if you want to sit with us, you're, you're welcome to sit with us. Because I told him the story would happen. So then I had a, a Russian friend that was there. And he's, uh, he's a man of power there. He's very respected. He's a lifer. So, he, you know, I gave him my paperwork. We locked in. And he went back, he was laughing at me. He was laughing at me. I'm going back and forth with the judge. And he said, you know, he spoke to a guy named Fitzy, who was the, and we didn't, he really didn't have a shot caller, but he was the most respected person because he's been down like 40 years. So he said, yeah, it's no problem. He can sit with us. So this is the interesting part. I was a Muslim dude on independent white time in the subgroup. Of, yeah, right? And it was crazy. Like, but you can do it. I mean, in a medium, you can do it. I didn't, in a pen, I doubt you could do something like that. Yeah, I don't think the Muslims but, would have been too happy with you being in a white car, being that you're Muslim and all of that. And not in a penitentiary. I mean, I guess in the FCI, I mean, obviously it was all right for you, but I've never seen nothing like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. 
it, it was, yeah, man, there was some, there were some guys that weren't too happy about it, but as long as they don't have, you know, they can't do anything about it because they're, you know, they just can't do anything. It's been passed and, and this is accepted. And uh, they, they can't fight Fitzy and they can't fight this Russian guy and these people. They know what's going to happen. But it was a great thing. I mean, and why not? Why shouldn't I? If you can have D.C. black guys sit on the D.C. black part and they're Muslim, well, why can't I sit with white guys? I, I grew up with white guys. So that's that's my mentality. I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up in the black section. So I don't know that many. You know, I know it. but And that's where I feel comfortable. That's what I told them. And I did my time there as a Muslim full time. Nobody bothered me, thank God. I mean, I wish I could tell you these great gladiator stories, but, you know, I'm 52 years old. I wasn't putting in too much work, you know, in my 40s. That's fine. But you bring a different perspective to Blood on the Razor Wire, right? Because you weren't a criminal. You walked into this prison system as a person who, you know, never had trouble, never had a misdemeanor, never had a felony. You were going to federal prison. So in your mind, did you think that federal prison was not too bad because it was federal prison well they try to they pass that off like i put on my the judge asks you when you're when you're sentenced he says did you have a preference so i said otisville because you know i'm muslim i want to get those kosher meals they got like a whole synagogue over there in otisville they got all the kosher food and there if you look on there in the as muslims we could eat we could eat the kosher jewish food so they got all the beef jerky and they got everything going on over there so I, and everybody's telling me otisville's place Otisville today, I think, is a place for dropouts and stuff like that. I don't know if it's the same as it was then. I put Otisville. What's that? So I want to ask you this. You know, walking into the prison system when you got the Raybrook, was it a little bit shocking to you that this is what prison really was? Well, I got there. First of all, Otisville, the judge put Otisville, but the BOP does what they want. They don't, they don't have to listen to what the judge says. They put me in Raybrook, and then I found out later it's because my code D was in Otisville. All right, but when you uh, when you walk back, my, when you walked in, I want to know what you thought when you seen it. Okay, okay. So I walk into Raybrook. I'm with my two sons, and uh, they're good boys, religious boys. And uh, we get there, and I hey, motherfucker, <laughs> like crazy screaming coming out from the yard. And I'm wondering, like, and I see my son's face turns like red. My youngest son, you know, he hears what's going on there. And even when I got in the prison, I was wondering, like, where's that coming from? Because I never heard people scream like that on the compound. Like, what was going on? That was the shoe. You hear it from the from the parking lot. It's screaming from the, the cages. So I get in there. I I take off all my, you know, my clothes, my clothes, my jewelry, my watch, whatever's in my pocket. And then you cross that line. And now you're a prisoner, you know? And uh, it's, you know, the first day you walk in there. The first day is not so hard, but then you start to realize they talk about your paperwork. You don't really know what that is. You don't. And then they try to they try to extort you a little bit. They try to feel you out, see where you're at. They throw some scenarios at you. And it got to me like I'm thinking like, wow, this. Place. And what it does is like a two year sentence, two and a half years can become a life sentence, because if I have to, I'm like, if it comes to rape, I'm going to kill somebody. You know, if, I'm not going to let that, and you don't want to let that happen. And so you're you're very nervous, and things are ruled by violence there. Did you so? Did you think going in that? there that? Did you think going in there that man, it was possible that you could be raped? Were you thinking stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, but I I promised. I mean, I would die before I'd let somebody do it. And if it if it did happen, I'm still going to come after them. You understand? I'm not going. I'll never let that happen. I'll. You know, hey man, it, I it's understandable, man. I mean, who the hell is going to go for that? You know, you, at least you would think that, but we both know that you know some people do go for it. I mean, I've seen people I, I, in prison. I've heard, listen, I've heard, I've heard crazy. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I've seen What's people it? in prison get slapped in the face, not fight back, get called names, not fight back, have their stuff stolen, not fight back. So I mean, things do happen, and I'm sure you've seen some of them things in there, right? I, I've seen it and I've heard it. I've heard some DC guys say some things that I was <laughs> just like, wait a minute. It didn't even make sense. It didn't even say good. And they're like, well, yeah, he did say that. And then I heard it. I heard him up in the cages and they, they went after a few dudes. Like, and they did some pretty unscrupulous stuff. It wouldn't, by our standard, is, is unacceptable. I mean, it's by them, it was, they, they do that. And, they, you know, guys telling the story and how they rape people. And, Booty bin. So the D.C. blacks were raping people at the prison you were at? 
I, I heard, I mean, I heard this kid t- telling stories how he did it. I don't know that all, I know, I know DC dudes that are great, you know, but some of them are just hideous in, in what they, they'll go with guys. And he says, I, I got two Puerto Rican bitches on the side and I got it. And I got a, I don't even want to repeat what he said in prison. I, I was walking down the railroad to the jail hall and it, it physically got me just to hear a man say that just made me repulse. You know, you know. So people like that, that's who we refer to as booty bandits. Yeah. Uh, alhamdulillah, I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't speak to them too much, these guys. I've seen them. There's, you know, they have their own little clique there. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. So, Yusuf, you know, the channel is about saving kids from life imprisonment and premature death through our stories. You have a different perspective because you weren't a criminal. You didn't commit crimes all your life. You know, you were accused of this little terrorist thing and... Whether it's true or not, I'm not here to debate that or really dig into that at all. But coming from, you know, a man that has sons that were religious, you got you got some boys of your own. What message would you give to kids that are on the wrong path? What would you tell them to the kids that are on their way to places like Raybrook if they don't change their ways? What would you tell them? Well, when it comes to green kids, I've seen kids come in from Vermont. Right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a grown man. I've seen kids come in, young kids, 18, 19, and all of a sudden they didn't even go to the judge yet. And they, they're starting to get teardrops and stuff on their, on their hands, like the stupidest thing you can actually do before you go to. You're going to get ruined. They're going to use you and abuse you. They're going to use you as a mule, and they're looking for you. They want you to click up with them. I would tell you, you know, what I did was stupid. And, you know, the way I spoke out, my case is different. You know, I was outspoken. I was trying to, I was the insignificant rebel trying to fight something that I'll never be able to be. So it was just a waste of my time. I would tell you to focus on your family, your friends, and your neighbors. And whatever you do, do it 100%. You know, jail, the worst part about jail is it destroyed me, literally. I, I mean, you know, oh, he just did a little two years Two years and three months is a long time for a human being at my age to be in prison away from their family and locked in at night with murders, you know, with people that have a life sentence. And it, my nerves are shot. I'm literally, it, it, I, I don't know how to explain it to you. It, it brings violence into you that you never had before. You dig it? No. So, you become institutionalized. And for me, I, there was things that I loved from prison. I mean, I want to tell the kids, yeah, don't go to prison. That's common sense. I'm telling you, it's not a place you want to be. But some people can change their life in prison, and it can be a good thing. For me, it, it, made, me, it made me institutionalized. Like, I, I, I still do the same thing. I do my time. I wake up. I iron my pants. I have my meals ready. I have like this, chick, 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 chick. My word is my word. I you know, respect, excuse me, in prison, everything is respect. The little dude that's this big or the dude this big, everything, you never walk in front of people, never reach over a table. And I live that to this day. And I wear it with a badge of honor, you know, but the psychological effect of it and being in in solitary confinement for six months, it takes a toll, you know, and it's not something, it's it's really not a place you want to be. You'd rather be at home. I can't think of uh, any better words to say because being home, being with your family, that's more important than anything else in the world. I believe that. I feel that. Man, I appreciate you coming on the show tonight. My pleasure. My pleasure. And, you know, I know you were affected by some things, Yusuf, and even with that little bit of time sitting in solitary confinement. That stuff hurts. And a lot of these kids yeah, don't yeah. know what it's like to be in solitary confinement for six months. You know, my suggestion is... You want to know about prison? Lock yourself in your bathroom for 24 hours. That's it. That's it. And and see if you can, you know, see see how that feels because that's what it's like. You're locked in your bathroom for days and weeks and months, some people for years. And it's just, it's unbelievable, man, some of the things that happen, you know? How about just being locked in? Like picture me being locked in with some country guy that just loves methamphetamine and shooting and telling me how great oh man like you love a snickers this guy's talking about it's crazy bro and you're locked in with him and you're just disgusted with him I, you know you're trying to have conversation 
and you're, you're like, hey, like, who would you like to see if you get out of prison? We had this, I said, I'd like to meet Cornell West and Noam Chomsky. Who would you like to see? He tells me, I'd like to see what it's that Kim Kardashian and Hulk Hogan. I was like, oh, man, All right, I'm going to bed, man. <laughs> just, just imagine being locked in with that and drug stories all day. Unbelievable. So I'm going to end this episode where we keep it real. We keep it raw. Until tomorrow, we're out. Thank you.